how toxic is your sunscreen? Unfortunately, everyone has just been told, use more sunscreen, slip, slop, slap, and stay out of the sun. And I agree with that. We do need to stay out of the sun a bit. We need to get sun exposure for our vitamin D. And maybe we need to think or rethink what we put on our skin, something I've been campaigning for about 20 years now. In fact, I wrote a little book 15 years ago, How Toxic Is Your Sunscreen? Now, updating that with all the information, it's still saying exactly the same stuff. The stuff they're putting in lots of the sunscreens is highly toxic. Now they're starting to move some of it out, but I'm gonna show you some of the ingredients. But first of all, we need to ask that first question, does it prevent skin cancer? We know it actually prevents sunburn because that's something you can see. The scientific studies are actually showing that maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It's not as clear cut. And you'd think, hold on, after 50 years of research, it'll be very clear cut. Uh, well, and probably just because I said that this will be removed, but these are what the studies are, are actually suggesting. So is it safe and is there a real benefit of these? Well, we need to look at the individual ingredients because there are safer ingredients that some companies, some very ethical companies are using, and I'll touch on that right at the end. And the first one I really want to get into is something called oxybenzone. And this is something that has been added, not just in, in um, uh, sunscreens, but also to personal care and cosmetics. Uh, it's also used in fabrics. So as a result, we know it accumulates in the environment. And in fact, the studies in the US show that something like 98% of the population have detectable levels of oxybenzone in their blood to the point where the US Food and Drug Authority, FDA, administration I think it is, have actually said we now need more evidence because this is looking like people are exposed to far too much of this. So they're already questioning it and unfortunately this should have been done 50 years ago. And then we got what we know from the studies in the wild is that it decreases reproduction in the wild. Now what's interesting about that is of course um, that's mimicked in the human population as well for the same reason. We know that exposure to lots of the toxic chemicals out there in, 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 in sunscreens and personal care products and, and our environmental exposure is reducing the reproductive rates in humans about the same rates as in the wild. Now, all of this evidence, by the way, originally comes from the wild dating back in the 70s, but we now know it's affecting humans as well. We know it affects the thyroid gland and in particular the hormones in the thyroid and we know thyroid conditions are increasing, particularly hypothyroid conditions, so less active thyroid conditions. Don't wait until you've got the conditions. Start now looking at for these ingredients. We know with women, endometriosis. With men, uh, it lowers sperm quality. Again, reducing the, reducing the possibility of reproduction. We know it's estrogenic, so that is, it gets in there and can mimic estrogen. Now, I'll do a whole video on uh, estrogen mimicking hormones and chemicals later on, so stay tuned for that. And while you're at it, please subscribe below, tick the buttons below and share this, because this is information, again, everybody needs to see. So it's, we know it's estrogenic, and I've got my little person here because these are the studies that have been actually done on humans as well, or at least humans have been involved in the research. And finally, we know it's an environmental poison. In other words, out there, it actually stops some of those microalgae from reproducing. It actually blocks some of the bigger algae and kills some of the coral reefs. So my message is, is this something you would wanna put on your skin? Other than oxybenzone, there's a whole heap of these chemicals that are put in sunscreens that have these estrogen-like effects. And if we start off, here's the first, first one, best abbreviated for MBC, for methylbenzenolidine. So for MBC, much easier. Now the problem is that the normal culture or the names that they use change. You've got the international levels, you've got the uh, uh, American names, you've got the whole thing. So it becomes quite confusing. So if it looks like a long chemical, it probably is, and it's probably one of these ones. Then we've got another one here, optylmethoxycinamate, also called OMC. Another one called avabenzene, uh, and there's a, the, the, again, for each of these, there's two or three different combinations of names that they can use. But what I want to explain here isn't about the names, 
It's about what they do. And these two, along with the oxybenzone, which I've already talked about, have strong estrogen-like effects. That is, they get in and mimic estrogen. Now, mimic in our estrogen in our body is uh, an accent in, in a really, really, really low levels, what's called parts per billion level, very, very low level. So any amount getting in, and it gets in there, and it gets on the estrogen sites, and it behaves like estrogen, except that stays there, sticks there, hangs around, and does a little bit more estrogen-like activity. So as a result, it brings that whole estrogen system out of balance. And so it's called an endocrine disruptor because it disrupts hormones, which is your endocrine system. And we see in pregnant mothers, for example, something I'm really trying to highlight here, it's detected in the infants. Um, it affects their reproductive facilities and capacities, uh, particularly in males. And so one of the things they see later in life is, is gonad size, testicular drop, um, uh, semen quantity, semen quality, a whole raft of those things which show up. And then along with that, these chemicals are linked in with thyroid disturbances. And there is an ever increasing number of people with thyroid inactivity, low thyroid activity. I see this in all my talks and people come out and say, well, you know, what do I do? And the first thing I say is get off these toxic chemicals because it's not just in the sunscreens, it's in lots of other chemicals. So thyroid, reproductive activity without doubt, the same as I mentioned in oxybenzone, female disorders, it's been linked, these chemicals have been linked with uh, endometriosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, and reproductive difficulty and a whole raft of other uh, effects down there. Again, because primarily the estrogen and the thyroid um, having an impact down there and even on bone health. So because bone health is determined largely also not just about calcium and the right protein and mix in there, but it's also the hormones that balance the osteoblasts, which put calcium on the bone, and the osteoclasts, which kind of take it off. So the message here is all of these. Now I've got uh, another one, avobenzene in here. And while it didn't have these estrogen-like effects, or I couldn't find it in the research, it definitely had thyroid effects. So impact on lowering the activity of thyroid. So in general, all of these chemicals here, now, the great thing is there is a lot of research gone in in the last 20, 30 years and products out there that are much safer. The problem with sunscreens is that they just don't stay on the skin. When you apply them to the skin, they literally get through into the blood and into very organs around the body. At least that's what all the studies have been showing for the last 20 years. And it doesn't matter one study or a couple of studies I found looked at different application methods, whether it was a spray, a, an oil, a cream, um, it didn't matter. All of them got through into the blood. So it all increased blood concentrations. And the last thing you want from a sunscreen is for it to be in the body, in the blood, circulating around to all the organs. And uh, although there's many more ingredients from the, the sunscreens that can have showed up in the studies, here are the top, 5, BP3, OMC, 4MBC, avobenzene, and octinoxate. You've heard me already talk about those ones. And all of those have been shown to get through into the blood. You ready? They're detectable at two hours, and the peak concentration is usually three to four hours. But what's scariest is that all of the levels exceed the Food and Drug Administration guidelines for these chemicals in the blood. The question is, what's it doing? Well, it's not just in the blood, and this is where it gets scary. It's also found in urine, breast milk, and what is scariest for me, it's found in fetal tissue. So the amniotic fluid, fetal and cord blood. So the message is, if you're pregnant and getting these exposure to these chemicals, given that they have lots of estrogenic effects, and you, you, you already know some of those from what I've presented, it's, it's really a question of should pregnant um, uh, ladies use any of these sunscreens. Then we get onto one other factor, which is really considered. When they look at a, um, an ingredient, any one of those ingredients I've shown you, they look at them individually and they don't consider what happens when there's three or four or five or six together, plus with other things added into them, e even things like essential oils, because it all changes the dynamics. And what's interesting is that the studies show that when you use sunscreens, it increases the permeability 
of the skin to lots of other things and in, protect, in particular pesticides so they become penetration enhancers so pesticides like DEET which is a very common one that's put in sunscreens um, uh, it's common in, in a lot of cosmeceuticals and so on uh, they go with the sunscreens and while they've tested DEET alone they haven't tested it with the sunscreens and they know that now know that DEET there is more DEET in the blood as a result of if it's mixed with sunscreens the same with a um, uh, with a herbicide called 2,4-D. Um, uh, this isn't commonly exposed for the general population, but if you're working out in agricultural areas, what these studies highlight, the organophosphates and other pesticides, is if you're working outside with pesticides in an agricultural area, you've probably got sunscreen on as well, so you're getting that double whammy negative benefit. And then also solvents. So if you're in an industrial solvent area or working with solvents, it doesn't matter. Any of the ones, the mechanics and cleaners and all those other people's use, there's more of that getting in to the blood. Now, the final aspect about this is that there are things can also increase the skin absorption of the sunscreens. And that includes sun damage, skin damage, cuts and abrasions, and all those other factors, which may lead to more sunscreen getting in to your blood. There are lots and lots of safer, natural, healthier compounds that can be used in sunscreen. And it all comes down to the dollar. It all comes down to the dollar. Now, I know at least a half dozen brands out there, and I'm not linked with any brands. You have to do your own checking out. I'll give some hints on how to do that out, um, do that for yourself. But what we've got is uh, um, an industry that's been going for 50 or 60 years now. They're used to producing all of these toxic chemicals uh, and they go into all the different industries and they're very cheap, very cost effective. Are they great for your skin and your health? Probably not, as I've already shown you. So what are the, by the way, I am well aware of a large organization that did want to go into the safer sunscreens, but found it too expensive and thought, well, no, my clients aren't going to buy that, therefore we won't. So they're well aware of how toxic their ingredients are. Coming back to it, there's a group of chemicals called polyphenols. I'm always talking about polyphenols because they're the big macro molecules, the big molecules that are uh, all the nutrients that people talk about, the things you get in turmeric and the things you get in your herbs and your spices, the things you get in green tea and black tea, the things you get in you know, um, a red wine and all the fruit and the veggies and all those good things that people are talking about. They're the polyphenols in many cases. And the ones that show up, and again, there are dozens of these that show up in the research. And it's about getting the right combination and doing the SPF test. So the skin protection factor test. And they show up as just as effective as the pharmaceutical, or sorry, the chemical led ones. And here you've got things like tea extracts, um, both green and black tea sharp as effective repellents, but also um, they're antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and they're tissue repairing. So any damage that is done, you can actually put them on later after a bit of sunburn, and it will actually help repair some of that damage that's been done. So then you've got, so you've got tea extracts, olive oil extracts, and the polyphenols of olive oil. Everyone knows it's not just the oil, but it's the nutrients, the, the ones, the really dense nutrients that are in olive oil, grapeseed extract, macadamia seed, chamomile, all of these, and including things like um, herbs and essential oils, so herb extracts and essential oils. There are dozens of these that show up in the literature. And really all it is is about uh, companies getting together and combining them, doing their tests, showing how effective they are, and then um, marketing it and getting it across to people that these products aren't as good as they show. You've also got things like other nutrients, coenzyme Q10, um, which I supplement with every day. Vitamin E, vitamin C are also active in terms of not just blocking the sun's rays, but also preventing any damage that's being done. So they have a win-win type of situation. The final part of all this is that it's not just the sun that causes skin cancer. I know this is a part that I will normally get blocked on the social media. I want to highlight the really critical, crucial and large role diet can play. There is overwhelming evidence that things in your diet can 
reduce your risk of skin cancers and your lifestyle. Uh, just a simple example is caffeine has been associated in dozens of studies, coffee I should say, coffee consumption and lower levels of, of um, skin cancer, as has a Mediterranean diet, as has an anti-inflammatory diet, as have. Um, and unfortunately, when people talk about this, they block it, so I won't go any further. But remember, if you want to avoid skin cancers, do the good things, get the good good chemical, safer chemical, natural ingredients in there, and look at your diet and lifestyle. There is no doubt the role stress plays on formation of skin cancers as well. So we look at that, and, and, and exercise, by the way, which is something I'm always talking about. So I've given you some alternatives, I've given you lots of ideas here to go back and think about. Um, please, if you like this information, subscribe below, share it with your friends, help me get this information out. If you would like a free copy of our original report, How Toxic Is Your Sunscreen, head straight to the links down below. I've put the link there below so you can download a copy and share it with your friends to get a bit of discussion going. And remember, subscribe to the channel and tell people about all the great information that we've got here.